Hello and welcome to ELT Under the Covers Crumbs on the Sheets, where we take a broader look at the education, learning and teaching industry community and we go a little bit more in depth into topics that are on our minds and have been suggested by you, our viewers. But first, introductions. I'm Neil, our team teacher. Hello everybody, it's Professor Rich. Okay, we're back Rich and we're also back with Rich tackling pre-sessionals. This is uh, how many this is how many times now that you've done pre-sessionals. Pre I actually don't have that much experience doing pre-sessionals. Although it's quite surprising because I love them actually, but I've I've only been doing pre-sessionals since 2022. So it's a relatively recent thing to me, just the past 2 years. So I've 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 only done a couple. Uh, should but we, should we do a, a quick review then of you know what it is that you like so much about pre-sessionals and you know uh, from 2022 to 2024 kind of where how you've progressed and you know what kind of things right. you've learned and what you think others can apply I think I was very lucky in that the first pre-sessional that I did was for Queen's University Belfast and honestly I think the team that they have there is very good and I think that's probably thing number one that I like about it is when you're working for a good institu institution which really values education and has the resources to back that up then you do tend to find that people can you know that people who are involved in that do have um, reasonable knowledge about education about the ways that things should be taught about the capabilities of teachers and therefore they're good people to work with and they they put together useful schemes of work and curricula which you know you can work with as a teacher who wants to make a difference as well as getting that kind of balance right between prescriptive material and the freedom that a teacher should have in delivering a course but i think i was relatively lucky because the first one i did queen's university belfast as i said they had they've got a good team and as a reflection they have good materials as well the materials were great uh, for the online pre-sessional and you know back then online was still a bit of a you know ooh, we've just had covid and we're online and you know people are kind of working out what to do with it but still there's all kinds of mis mystery boxes going on but it they were good and i had good materials to form a basis on and i found myself just referencing back to those actually and being able to compare to those really that pre-sessional set the benchmark mm. and right now what's happened is that the company who i work through a company called into universities they are massive. They're like the biggest provider of pre-sessional courses, um, in, at least in the UK, probably in the world. And they, they have partnerships with hundreds of universities, I believe. Um, and uh, what's, they're, what's your they're... reference code for uh, people to sign up? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I, I wish I had one of those. Yeah. So, no, no, it sounds like you do it. You, you know, they're a, a good company. They seem, they, yeah, they're all right. Yeah, considering what they are, especially because what they are effectively is they're like the middleman. You know, they've been set up as this company. They they focus on pre-sessional courses. It's not just English, actually. They do other they do other stuff, uh, sessional and pre-sessional uh, education. So it's kind of higher education stuff, basically. But uh, they're big business. Um, I think how they started is pre-sessional English courses. And if you consider, oh, middle, a middleman doing in pre-sessional English courses, that could go horribly wrong. You know, mm -hmm. that sounds like a, a money spinner. And everyone knows pre-sessional course, English courses kind of are a, min a money spinner and always have been. Um, for, for Well, I don't know about always have been, but they certainly are. And it's the way that most universities treat them. Someone doesn't quite meet the grades for a university degree that they're going to study. So you say to them, OK, pay us this huge amount of money. You can do our pre-sessional English course, which will prepare you for academic skills academic environment and is an intensive English course which will theoretically bring up your IELTS score by whatever it needs to be brought up by of course you don't actually need to retake your IELTS no. we'll just assume that by
by t passing the assessments on the pre-sessional English course that y your IELTS score but, would but, have gone but, up. Pray tell, Rich, what, what would happen if someone didn't pass? Well, that is an interesting question. But um, does that I, ever happen? I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> so essentially, really um, if it, it does happen, but if it did happen, but the way it would happen is the teacher would re we'd really need a lot to be able to demonstrate as to why it happened, because if someone's paid a great deal of money and then doesn't pass the course, what you don't want is for that to be turned around and put on the course providers, obviously. So, you know, we look at certain things like attendance, participation in e-learning, uh, response to feedback, things like that. And obviously a record of all this stuff is kept. Essentially, if you're ticking all the boxes, then you should be passing. And if there was a case that a student wasn't passing but was ticking all those boxes, you might think, I mean, there would actually genuinely be something wrong there because that mm -hmm. shouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these students should be coming in at an IELTS 5.5 or whatever, and you're just supposed to be getting them up to an IELTS 6.0. It's not, you know, it's not immeasurable. You know, it is yeah. so, it's not... It's not beyond the realms of imagination. It's something that should be possible in, in an intensive eight to 12 week course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the idea is that the students are um, do, doing active learning for at least 20 hours a week, um, which is the time in class plus the time outside of class. So 20 hours of active learning a week for eight weeks, you know, that's quite a bit of work. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a, yeah, it's a quite a bit of work. It's um, I, I actually don't know what the definitions of a full time and part time course are, are, but it sounds pretty. So, sounds sounds like it's getting towards full time anyway. If it's part time, it's certainly a, a hefty part time, isn't it? It's what we would probably call intensive. Mm -hmm. So, so it should be possible. So, if someone were at, were actually coming to all the classes, doing all the homework, and completing the e learning and failing, uh, that would should be unheard of and i think if something like that happened you know it'd have to be um you know focus main cannons and um and fire away everyone you'd, you'd have to do everything you could to get that student through so unofficially there is kind of this i think this is what neil is alluding to is that there's an unof there's kind of this unspoken rule that everybody passes the pre-sessional english course and basically that is the case if someone doesn't pass, then it will be because of shoddy, really shoddy attendance, cheating, um, completely failing to follow the teacher's feedback, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Other than that, you really have an obligation to get everyone through it because they basically paid thousands of pounds to jump um, their English up so they can come to the UK and study. That's the point of it. Mm -hmm. So the universities traditionally offered these themselves and they kind of had someone at the university who every summer would hire a temporary English teachers because, of course, these are just summer jobs, put it all together and then wrap it all up. And I guess where Into came in is they just got really good at doing that and, you know, decided, hey, universities do you want to just contract us instead and then you don't need to worry about the whole thing and you don't need to worry about hiring and firing well hiring these teachers uh, just temporarily and blah 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 and we're the experts anyway you can see how it got set up mm -hmm. and they're pretty good at it and honestly most of the people who i've worked with through into have been good people to work with especially the the, the course coordinators and so on. So yeah, you're right. I do have quite good things to say about them. I think they are a reasonably good company. So now what they're doing with their online stuff is it's more centralized. So previously when I worked for Queen's University Belfast, that was done through the Into team at Queen's who are still there delivering the in-person pre-sessional and sessional English courses. However, now for the online courses, it's been centralized, uh, interestingly enough, to Brighton University. It's the into offices in Br Brighton University mm -hmm. who um, are the kind of central administration for all of the online into courses now. Now, I don't know kind of what, what centralization and stuff, something 
I can see why people do it and whatnot, but maybe sometimes you lose things. And it is interesting because the course, like they've got these course materials and you could imagine that, you know, they've gone through them like a fine tooth comb. But in my opinion, they are, to me personally, they don't make as much sense as the Queen's University Belfast materials like the the materials that they had put together and i wonder if it's just more that they've tried to go for a bit more of a one size fits all or a bit more prescriptive mm -hmm. and by the way they're still totally open in saying you know the teacher is the one you know the teachers can adapt materials make decisions about what to change blah 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 blah. you know so they're happy to go along with all that but the materials as they are i would say are less I don't know. I just, I just haven't, I haven't found them a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. They are, in general, actually, I found them to be a bit more form focused. Um, they were doing things from a very form style perspective, and they, things just didn't seem to flow in the kind of way that I would want them to flow. So actually, I've changed quite a lot, and I've referred back to all the materials that I've used. Now, in terms of kind of lessons learned. Um, I think I've I've been able to uh, I've, uh, with 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 the advantage of having worked previously with Chinese students, which is I, I'm currently teaching eighteen t Chinese students. Mm -hmm. I know the issues that came up last time: plagiarism, uh, trying to cheat, um, trying to do as little work as possible, copy and pasting stuff, paying other people to write the essays for them. So, you know, I just went into that stuff as hard as possible, as soon as possible. And I, I just basically emphasized the point of, I'd rather that you wrote me something with poor English, which is your own work, than give me something which isn't your work with perfect English. And I emphasized the marking based on that. And, you know, touch wood, we got the end of week one now, and it seems like just preempting that, means that it's been okay in my particular group. I think I've only had one guy who I suspect used AI and uh, I've called him out on it. I'm waiting for his response. I didn't, I didn't call him out in person. I've just sent him an email about it, give him some time to think it over. Um, I just asked him to explain. Um, I, I, I noted basically four features which differed between one writing he did and the next writing, mm -hmm. uh, one of which appears to be his own work and the next one which doesn't appear to be his own work. Um, and there were things like uh, the first one has UK spelling standards and the second one has US spelling standards. Mm -hmm. The first one has lots of English errors and the second one has no English errors. Um, the, you know, the first one, there's the second one. That, anyway, it's just just a whole bunch of stuff. And then I just basically said to him, can you explain these differences? <laughs> like, how, this, <laughs> how did this happen? And we'll see, we'll see what he comes back with. Um, but, did you, uh, did other you give that, him an out? People... Do you know, like, a, a way to save face? It's not really about saving face. It's more, the thing is... That I can't particularly give him a. I mean, <sighs> do you know? So you can, so you can kind of go. Can you explain this? And I'll be like, and then add something on to be the case of like, um, uh, yeah, I know that this can be a new kind of way of doing things, but it's really important that we focus on this art, right. on you know, giving original material going forward. Yes. I, I don't I, I don't know so, just kind of like a shot about across the bow kind i haven't of thing. yeah i haven't got to that yet when when i've been when i've been mentioning this in the classes i've said stuff like that ah. like it's a new way it's a different culture blah 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 you know all that kind of stuff so i've kind of emphasized that in the classes as for in this particular case i think if he admits to using ai then i'll do that um if he doesn't, then maybe I'll say something like that to see whether that will change, mm -hmm. whether he does admit it. Uh, but if he completely denies it and doesn't give a good explanation, then that'll be that'll be a referral to the program manager who will meet with him and discuss it right. because it go it goes into disciplinary there. So this is mm. probably the first interesting and rather contentious point that I think we could talk to about the. 
this university pre-sessional in 2024, mm -hmm. um, which is the policy is, and this is reflective of some, but not all university policies on generative AI. The policy is that um, irrespective of the utility of generative AI in real life, generative AI should not be used by students for any part of the pre-sessional course including assessed work or unassessed work so you shouldn't use generative ai for anything as basically as a student as part of the pre-sessional english course and part of our induction as teachers was a rather simplistic uh, indu induction on how to recognize quite um i might say um not very sophisticated attempts at producing uh, AI written work. And uh, there were some kind of tests on that and what you might see. So basically I try seeing how to um, identify students who'd used AI. So it's a, it's a big thing for them. And that's the, that's the policy of the course. Now I can see why they've gone with that policy because you've got a mix of policies from universities. There's no, there is no one size fits all on AI and the universities have not come to anything near to a consensus the range of policies seems to range from don't use it at all to um you can use it pretty much completely freely as long as you're open about it as long as you always like say this you know you reference it basically you say chat gpt said this you know or whatever mm -hmm. um there's there's ways there's ways of doing it so that said, I wonder if there is an argument to make that it would make more sense for us to go somewhere down the middle rather than taking the most extreme standpoint, because obviously I guess they're doing that just to cover their base and saying, right, what is the most extreme university on AI? What are they doing? Right. Okay. We're going to do that. But I think going forward, that position is, I guess, I don't know if you would agree, it's untenable mm. to have the position that basically zero use of AI in assessments and um, unassessed work on the course. I think it's kind of an arms race, really, if you think about it, you know, like if because students are it's. Do you know, like uh, <laughs> the dark, dark night, <laughs> where Gordon's saying to like Batman, he's like, "Oh, you know, you wear the mask now, and that means you know you're um, inviting others to do the same." You know, it's the opposite. You know, students are going to use the generative AI. They are going to use it. They are going to test the boundaries. Uh, and if you know, universities make a a statement of the where they're going to say we're not going to use it at all then you're going to be at a disadvantage you know you don't want to be the only guy mm. uh, you don't want to be um the only guy with the knife at a gunfight so you know i think it's, it's gonna have to navigate through it and and integrate it uh, and you know come to some sort of either regulation or standardized agreement or something like that yeah um so first of all i think the probably yeah i guess standardized agreement might well be something something that happens in the future when you start talking about only guy with a knife to a gunfight are you talking about like the kind of competition between universities what what are we talking about here uh, i'm talking competition between universities the uh, dynamic between students and teachers because you know you could be putting a ton of effort in um to come up with uh, materials teaching and stuff like that and you know if they're not even thinking about all all of you know those materials and completing those materials they're just getting a, an ai to do it then it's kind of like you know what's the point in you putting in all that effort where you could just use J ai to you know generate it quickly because they're using ai to generate their answers and complete it quickly 
So, you know, and <laughs> but then obviously it's like AI is teaching AI. <laughs> And no one's right. no one's no one's getting skills so, for so teaching. No is... one's getting skills for learning. Right. So the thing is, my my argument here would be whether or not you have a policy that blocks AI for everything or just for some things, mm -hmm. it doesn't change the fact that you still need to be able to identify AI, mm -hmm. or, and even the possibility. If you can't identify it, then who cares anyway, right? So, because you wouldn't be able to know. So, I think my argument is that what we should have instead is we should have a little bit more openness about how AI can be used mm -hmm. and some sort of, yeah, some sort of guidelines which more or less people can stick to. And some universities have established this, you know, and some there's quite some quite reasonable stuff out there. For example, can stu could students use AI to help them brainstorm ideas for an essay title, mm -hmm. you know? And I think for something like that, why not? It's a tool. There are other tools you could use for helping brainstorming. And if I go down to see, this is a thing you can, an analogy you can make as well, because do you know, if you go down to a cafe and we have a conversation and I talk to you about my psychology study that I'm doing with a thousand participants and, oh, this weird thing happened that, you know, the people who did this, this happened. And you're like, hey, Rich, you know what it looks like? It looks like the people who did this, they're having this effect. And I'm like, oh, you're right. That's amazing. And then I go away and write that in my thesis. Then that I've actually pl committed plagiarism, whether or not you consent to your idea being mm. used doesn't yeah. matter it's true uh, it's fact, like they've the got they're talking to their friends and you know they're getting brainstormings from there or it, you could actually go even further and make an mm. argument in that it's if you were to use generative ai you know like to brainstorm um it might actually be a leveling field because before you would have to uh, have money to access someone like a tutor that can kind of break down different parts of IELTS and give you ideas and give you all this different information and stuff. But now we've got the internet and generative AI. Where we've got access to that same information without the cost. Well, as much of the cost. Um, and that could be, you know, a boon for those that are a little bit more underprivileged that don't have access to great friends that can give them ideas or you know, the money to pay for tutors to help them level up. I think that's true. However, there is also the case that, you know, if one situation is plagiarism, then the other situation would be as well. Mm. Uh, the, the argument I was going to go on to make is that if you went down to the cafe and spoke to your friends about ideas for your, for your, for the title of your essay, that wouldn't necessarily be, be plagiarism. As long as it's not, as long as you're not representing, because plagiarism is rep, like representing someone else's idea as your own yeah. is, is, is sort of the main thing. Unattributed as well. Um, so, yeah. So I, anyway, I think this is not for me to work out. I'm not, I'm not the university policy guys, right? They have to work that out. And some of them have. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I think, I think it sh we should be allowed, the, the upshot is I think we should be allowing students to use it for a number of reasons. One, um, unsophisticated use of AI is obvious. Teachers can identify it. And it's particularly obvious when you scrutinize and interrogate. So when you find a text, which is AI written by a student who has an IELTS 5.5, and suddenly they've got this text, which is like IELTS 8. And you're like, what? You've written that, have you? Right. And then if you just say to them, so here, when you said that um, the, you know, superfluous use of extended matrices was incoherent, then what did you mean? And they're like, Ugh. they start dribbling, you know, then, um, <laughs> then clearly you can see that there's been some sort of issue, especially if you, you know, ask 10 questions about 10 different parts of the essay and they never have an answer. Mm -hmm then it becomes very clear that we have an issue 
if if it's not AI, then there's some other issue, like maybe they paid someone to write it for them or something like that. So under scrutiny and interrogation, unsophisticated use of AI is obvious. Now, sophisticated use of AI, as me and you know, uh, might not be so obvious. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can even do stuff like just take the whole list of characteristics of AI writing, put that into your GPT-4 and say, don't do any of this. Or, you know, take this text and do the opposite to all these things in this text to make it look completely not like AI. And then you can feed that yourself into Zero GPT, which is one of the free online AI checkers which people use. And it will come back and say 0% AI. This text was human written. So, you know, with a bit of sophistication, it's not that hard, especially if you pay for GPT. It's not that hard to get around it. Mm -hmm. and therefore you've still got access to your AI, and there isn't a damn thing that these teachers can do about it. Apart from the interrogation, again, there's something to be said for the interrogation, but really sophisticated use of AI would also involve you engaging with the material in some way. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, that I was writing my essay on the pros and cons of students using AI in the classroom, and um, I kind of you know, did it in this kind of more sophisticated way where, you know, I say to the AI kind of, I want you to plan an essay for me about the pros and cons of using AI, ask me 10 questions to help plan the essay and it asks me the 10 questions and then it plans the essay and then I say, okay, make three sub points for each of the points of the plan and then I say, okay, now can you like write the essay and then I say, okay, now can you apply these rules? You know, I'm kind of engaging with the material there. And as long as I'm engaging with it to a significant extent, then I might know quite a lot about the subject as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of sophisticated use of AI, you could hide even with the interrogation. Mm -hmm. However, when you're getting to that extent, it actually becomes quite a lot of effort to use AI as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone might think, well, actually, maybe it's worthwhile me just writing an essay. It also depends on you know, the payoff, doesn't it? Like how, what is the mark, what's the weighting of the marks? And I think this is an important point as well, that obviously one way of tackling this is to reward students a bit more for showing independent ideas, for being able to defend their essay in an interview and things like that, rather than having like crystal, crystally clear, perfect, um, you know, grammar and but English isn't and spelling that and all kind of, of stuff the, like to, that. Just to push back a little bit, isn't that kind of the point? You know, like when we're when we're doing these IELTS essays, isn't the idea that we're actually looking at the the language and the structure rather than particularly the ideas? Because we're not we're, we're you know like when I'm doing like a an essay and I'm trying to get them to formulate and brainstorm around a particular topic you know um i'm not necessarily testing their knowledge on on that thing just especially when it's um uh, like a task two looking at mm. graphs or something like that I, i'm more kind of like are they putting it together right well i mean you know it's just a component uh of yeah. of that whole thing if if you were to if we were to argue this is you know where I'm a philosophy teacher and I'm getting an essay from a student and I'm kind of looking to understand their broad understanding of the ideas, then, you know, like I, I might kind of be go, oh, okay, they, they, they didn't structure it very well, but I can see the ideas. Is it not really, do we really need to focus that much on that for IELTS? So I think with something like IELTS or Cambridge English or whatever, then obviously the focus is more on language since it is a language exam. Mm -hmm. However, there is kind of the perspective of looking at how clear someone's communication is mm -hmm. rather than what kind of their perfect form is. Now, form is a part of it and it always will be a part of it. And obviously that is going to be there, but we've already seen over time that form has become less important, even in things like IELTS yeah. and Cambridge English, where rather than looking, rather than saying, for example, how, how many, you know, 
second conditionals did they use? You'll see things like structures the message well and you know errors don't impede communication and stuff like that. So they've already shifted that way anyway. But also what we have here, Neil, is with the pre-sessional English course, we're teaching something called English for academic purposes, yeah. which is essentially a combination of study skills plus English. So therefore, we also have an argument on this course that we're moving away from just the idea of purely teaching English and we're moving towards other skills um, in terms of composing, in terms of academia, actually, not even yeah. necessarily composing an essay, but in terms of academia. I, I just so, have a, you know, a be in my bonnet with the, uh, because, you know, I don't particularly consider myself to be super academic. Uh, and, you know, I, I just want to champion a little bit of the more non academics, you know, that come in, that, that are going to university for, like on sports stuff or kind of like uh, music or art kind of thing you know where they don't have to write essays and, and stuff like that but they kind of having to force down this route because it, they are going to university therefore it is they need these academic skills when you know they might not have that or oh, well, I, I yeah actually i think i think it would i think a lot of that would depend on the course because the for each course they will set an ielts requirement that's true so you know if, if they've set an ielts requirement of 6.0 for the music course then there must be one reason why you you need it now you could make the argument that well it's because they need the speaking and listening and not necessarily the reading and writing and that might be true and that's just unfortunately the problem with having a course that you can't always make it totally specific for each person so you might have someone who needs more speaking and listening you might have more someone who needs more reading and writing and i do have examples of that in my current student cohort you know there's some people who are like who've got seven for speaking and and, and listening uh, but their reading and writing is not very good and the, the university wants them to have better and it, and vice versa people who have very good reading and writing and not so good speaking and listening so there's a kind of a flattening of the spiky profiles thing going on with this course and i think that just that's just any kind of course isn't it it's like you could also say well that student that's going on to to study music you might have some students who can like read the music really well and can compose songs in their head and write them down on sheet music and then you have but they can't play very well and then you've got someone else who's like a maestro yeah. on guitar but doesn't know how to write music and they're going to be doing the course and everyone's going to be doing the lessons that you know wouldn't necessarily be appropriate entirely for everybody at every point that's just that's just the problem with courses isn't it um but uh anyway the point is that there are there's, there's some the study skills are part of the course and um if i tell you about the mark scheme now so the mark scheme for the writing in particular this is the final assessed writing which is 70 percent of the overall my writing mark there's 20 criteria each criteria gets a mark out of 100 which i quite like actually rather than just this yes and no, you can kind of give a mark out of 100. 100 might be a little bit too much, to be honest, but uh, it gives teachers a lot of flexibility anyway. Uh, 70 plus is considered C1. Uh, 50 is considered a B1, just to give you an idea of scale. So 50 mm -hmm. B1, uh, 70 plus is C1 and above. And um, out of those, there are five areas that relate to language, and they are... Accuracy of grammar, range of grammar, accuracy of vocabulary, range of vocabulary, and academic style, which is the formal, hedging, uh, objective, blah, blah, blah. That's it. So that's, fi that's five out of 20. And um, actually only, only two of them relate to accuracy. The other two are about range. Mm. so you could for example attempt a second conditional and make a mistake and still get like good marks for range but not necessarily such good marks for accuracy so i think they've gone the right way with that actually yeah. and um because of that i can make the argument to my students i can i can genuinely make the argument to my students that i can reward you more for responding to my feedback for writing a, a, an, an essay with um, interesting ideas, with a clear message, uh, with a range of sources. You know, I can give you more marks for that than what you would get 
from just using the language well. And you might think, well, I can use ChatGPT and that means it'll produce the language really well. And that's true. And maybe you get the marks for the language, assuming that I don't realize you've used ChatGPT and therefore you'd get removed from the course. Um, but it is true, you could get better marks for that language, but then you're not going to get great marks for responding to feedback. And not unless you're really clever, in which case you're kind of using my feedback with ChatGPT. But then again, it comes to the point of, is it actually worth the effort doing all that? You might as well just write the essay and respond to my feedback, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's, it's weighted to what develop. you want, uh, or how you see things, um, which is great. And you can demand high, and if they don't meet that demand, um, they still get credit for uh, attempting or giving it their best shot. I th that sounds great. Yeah. I, I know I'm talking a lot, Neil, but I've, I've, there's just there's just like five minutes or so, and there's, there is something I kind of want to say. Well, we could always do a, a, a we, we could always do a part up. one and part two because I feel like this is an onion. It is an onion, but um, let me make this one point while mm -hmm. it's kind of while I'm feeling kind of passionate about it and it's on my mind, which is um, you know there's a there's a real juxtaposition for me to make between this course that I'm doing right now, pre-session language course, compared to the Ascentis Skills for Life courses that I teach year round. And that juxtaposition is, although it's not perfectly in alignment with my kind of wants as a teacher or my beliefs as what are beneficial for students as a teacher, it is so much more in alignment teaching this course than the ESOL mm. Skills for Life course. In that with the ESOL Skills for Life course, it very much feels like the exam is just this pain in the ass, box ticking thing, which gets in the way of any real useful teaching that takes place. At the very most charitable interpretation you could possibly have, it provides a very skeletal, stiff scaffold that you can plonk a grammar-based syllabus on top of. However, the pre-sessional English course is, okay, it's not perfectly in line with, the, with what I think is the best way of students learning. That's never going to happen. But I don't feel like it gets in the way of it, at least. Like today in the class, I introduced uh, the Cornell note-taking method, and we, um, we chatted about stress, and we watched that wonderful video uh, from Kelly McGonigal about um how how to manage stress and she talks about some great it's a, if you haven't seen it it's a fantastic you probably have seen it it's about 10 years old it's a ted talk she talk and she talks about how um the negative effects of stress only apply if you think stress is negative so if you actually have the belief that stress is positive you don't get negatively affected in the same way by stress it still affects you but it's a different physiological response and she studied that and she proved it uh, so it's a fantastic, really interesting video to watch. So we watched that. We had a great chat about it. Then we applied using Cornell notes to the video, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end of the class, I said, you know, you can use this as your first entry in your reading and listening log, which is an assessed part of the course. So then I showed them like how they might do that and just kind of steered them into doing it. So, you know, this is a, it was a, a good example of how you can have, uh, a, a lesson on something which you kind of believe in and a good lesson that teaches some good techniques and then it actually connects well to the course uh, which I find so much more difficult to do with the ESOL skills for life stuff you know it's just you're really trying to get the square pegs to go through the round holes with that whereas here it's like it's just a lot more I wish I could define this in more kind of stru structured language but it's just it, it's just so much more um, easier to connect to as a teacher, you know, it's, it just seems to be a better fit for actual real learning pedagogy, things that we can believe in, you know, and it's not only me that seems to think this as well, there's other teachers who have different styles, different ways of doing stuff, you know, more kind of like, here are the points that you need to do on this, so do them kind of teachers and it works okay for them as well so it is possible to have sort of a core structure which is a bit more i don't know sort of it can be 
better adapted to the the sort of style of the teacher and the the pedagogical beliefs of the teacher and i think that's the way we should go with things it'd be it'd be interesting to, to know why that is what is it about the pse syllabus which just works better in my opinion than the esol skills for life curriculum you know is it an exam board thing is it a syllabus thing is it schema work is it a company thing is it the fact that i have a little bit more control over the assessments for this I, um i don't know that, i mean that maybe is a question for another day but anyway, yeah i that's think that's a, a question for another day and we'll put we'll put a pin in this and we'll actually um send it out to the uh, to the customers to <laughs> our listeners our watch or watchers um what do you think um how can we unpack that do you have any ideas let us know in the comments below and like share subscribe tick the bell and make sure that you're here for when we follow up on this particular topic but remember leave that comment so we know what you think thank you and bye if you're looking for more information uh, from myself, uh, you can go to teamteacherchina.com. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of materials, PowerPoints that you can use instantly in the classroom. We've got a Team Teacher China YouTube channel where we have videos teaching you how to use those uh, materials. Team Teacher English where we put those materials into a, a video form for self-study. And Team Teacher Baby where I take my experience as a teacher and put that into parenting. And go to YouTube.com slash Professor Rich to see some English teaching you can catch me weekly live streams on oxford online english youtube channel oh and also you can you can do a youtube search for pog space uk and you would get my alpha version of my new gaming channel which actually just have some trial content on there at the moment you can email us here at elt under the covers of gmail.com if you have anything you'd like to contribute to the show smash that like button share and subscribe and, and watch 100 of the video and don't exactly. click off thank you <laughs> bye